Hello, everyone, and welcome to Neosystems' webinar today, Cracking the Ice, Ensuring a Compliant Incurred Cost Emission. I'm Brian Giblin, Product Manager here at Neosystems. I'll be one of your presenters today. First, I wanted to mention DCAA audits over 1,600 government contractors and their incurred cost proposals each year. And the forecast is for more, not less. Today, we're going to share with you some information that will help to mitigate the risk that your audit will result in an adequacy letter. For our agenda today, first I'm going to go through some brief introductions. And then we're going to get right into the incurred cost proposal itself. We're going to talk about who needs to submit one, as well as the consequences of noncompliance. Then we're going to look in the ICE model and take an in-depth look at each of the schedules as well as best practices and tips as you go about completing it. We're going to look at reporting applications and how you can use them to make this tough job just a little bit easier. Finally, we're going to look at how you mitigate your risk of receiving an inadequacy letter. Then we're going to open it up to your questions. But if at any time you have a question, please feel free to put that question in the question box so we can get to it during the presentation. So very briefly, who is Neosystems? At Neosystems, we're proud to say, grow ahead, we've got your back office. We provide strategic back office services, including accounting, HR, and IT. And we have consulting services that form an umbrella, including implementations such as GCS, Dell Tech First, Cost Point. We also do upgrades, like upgrading from Cost Point 6 to Cost Point 7. In addition, we provide financial planning and analysis services, including forward pricing, budgeting, DCAA audit guidance, and of course, incurred cost proposal support. With me today, I have Carlos Alvarado. He's our Vice President of Financial Planning and Analysis. Carlos has 15 years of financial and managerial accounting experience across government contractors and commercial entities. He's been with NEO now for over nine years, and he leads our FP&A team, who routinely prepare 40 to 50 incurred cost proposals per year. As I mentioned, I'm Brian Giblin, Product Manager at NEO Systems. And before I turn it over to Carlos, we'd like to get to know you a little bit better, so we have a poll question for you. Does your company submit an incurred cost submission? For some of you, this is going to be obvious. You're the one who prepares it, so the answer is yes. For some of you, you might not need to prepare it yet, or it might not apply to you, so it might be no. Some of you may be new to your company, or it might not be your department, so you don't know. Does your company currently submit an incurred cost submission? Results are coming in. Close the poll, and let's see those results. Not surprising for an audience attending a, a webinar on incurred cost proposals that, yes, 80, over 80% 80 of you currently submit an incurred cost proposal. Carlos, now I'm going to turn it over to you. Take us into the meat of our presentation. Sure. Thank you, Brian, for, for that um, very good information and also an introduction. Thanks, everybody, as well, for joining today's webinar. I know it's uh, always busy times, and I uh, appreciate taking the time to do that. So um, to get started, for those, I noticed that there were some some folks that are not submitting um, are currently an incurred cost submission. So I'd like to set the stage, if, if I can, please, on that. It really, uh, incurred cost submission is, is reporting, basically, all of your incurred costs uh, throughout the year in, in, a, in a government uh, fashion, based on what they want you to submit and based on the schedules that are required. Um, it's basically looking at your financials um, and, and, and looking into your direct and indirect costs and, 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 and submitting that based on, uh, on a by contract basis and the different cost elements related to those contracts. Now, the question is, who needs to submit one? Well, I'm sure that question is always out there um, in terms of, well, do I need to do one or do I not need to do one? Well, just you got to look into your contracts. you got to look into, your, uh, uh, into the clauses, especially the one stated here on the slide. Um, and also being flexibly priced contracts, whether it's a cost plus or TNN, or even uh, when it comes down to any LOE or an IDIQ contracts. So you got to keep an eye out for those 
for those clauses that, are, that will be part of your contract. Uh, and also, um, it, one of the other things uh, to, to mention as well is the fact that just because you are required to do one because of the clause being on your contract, you may not need to submit it because you may not have an assigned cognizant DPAA office um, uh, in an auditor assigned to you. So just because you don't have an auditor assigned or an office assigned to you, that doesn't mean that you don't have to do it. That just means that you have no one to submit it to. So make sure that if you do have that clause, if you are required to do that because of the contract, that you have to do the income calculation. Now, consequences. Well, I mean, of course, no one wants to be non-compliant. Uh, one of the things that I, I, I recently um, was released um, by the Inspector General out of the Department of Defense, um, there was a report back in March 2013, rather, uh, where, and, I, I mean, and I'm quoting this, that say, we found that the DCA uh, did not exercise professional judgment in performing 74% of the sample that they actually took of um, assignments that they were, that were reviewed. Now, that's pretty interesting because that only means one thing, that they're, all they're going to do is increase the level of scrutiny that is going to go on to this audit. Um, and so you got to keep that in mind. So with that, uh, think about the penalty. Think about whether, you know, if you're not submitting those, uh, if you're receiving those letters, of uh, inadequacy letters, um, pay attention to those dates because those dates mean something. They're not just there just because they're there. So, and also the risk of, of the likelihood of, of uh, any future audits, not only on anchor cost submissions, but all the different audits, such as maybe uh, uh, pre-award audits, post-award, uh, system audits, even uh, forward checks. I mean, you know, you, I'm sure a lot of you guys have gone through that. So all of that could trigger that, especially if you're non-compliant. Now, <clears throat> of course, DCA provides an avenue in, 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 in to, to give the contractors a way to make it easier on, on them. Uh, and that it is through the Inker Cost electronic, electronic rather, uh, model that they offer through their website. You can download them, it's a zip file, you can download them and, and, and get that. But it is a template. So you got to make sure that, okay, you got the model, you can do it. Uh, that, that's not just going to um, uh, uh, guarantee uh, that it's all going to be good with, with just the template itself. One of the things that we recommend is that when you look at those um, uh, into the template, uh, the template that you actually download, uh, make sure all those macros that come with it. I'm sure you guys have seen that, especially on the latest uh, release of that uh, of, of that ICE model back in 2012, June 2012. Um, those can be confusing. So um, you know there are, there are a lot of macros there where where you have to, uh, especially on your structure, if you have um, two overheads or multiple um, service centers that you have to kind of apply those macros and it starts and, and the spreadsheet starts expanding. So uh, it could be confusing and if it breaks uh, you could be into a, uh, spending quite a bit of time trying to troubleshoot that. So what we say is consider your own model. Um, consider your own template. Uh, keep up with the changes, of course. Keep up with DCA um, releases every year. Uh, and the other thing is to keep in mind is to have an internal and external version of that. And that means that in an internal version, keep your comments, keep your notes, keep your validation checks and balances. When you get into the external version, that's the sanitized version that goes out. Now, you know, as you know, for those that have gone through this process, is that it takes years, right? An average of three to five years, um, depending on how the, uh, the visibility into the contract and how large you are, of course, that, <clears throat> that they're going to go back and audit that. So it takes that long. So I'm sure you're not going to remember the fact that what you where were the reasons why you did it a certain way? So the internal version and comments and validation notes and things of that nature are critical to put into those models. Now, schedule changes. Well, there, there, there have been some changes back in 2012. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, uh, the schedules Q and the comparative analysis, and uh, those are now renamed to supplemental A's, one through four. Uh, uh, the other one to reference here is the Schedule T, which is the executive compensation, that also has been renamed. Some things to consider uh, and to also uh, note is the fact that some uh, um, some schedules have been taken out, which is great. Right? You don't have to worry about them anymore, uh, which is the Schedule P, which is related to the IR and D in, in the B&P purposes, and the R, which is related to uh, corporate taxes and things like you know, of that nature. So, hey, just make a note. You don't have to do them. Um, uh, some other considerations here is modifications to some of the schedules. 
Uh, one thing that you've got to keep in mind, and I didn't mention this in the previous um, slide, is the fact that there are some things that you need to include uh, into some of the schedules. Uh, for example, in Schedule J, which is the subcontractor uh, schedule, um, you need to include information such as the type of subcontract that you have uh, with the vendor. And also include, uh, for example, a period of performance for that uh, vendor itself for that one subcontract that you have with them. Now, one of the things about the period of performance, or even the, the value itself for that subcontract that you have with them, is the fact that that may not be in your accounting system. I mean, unless you're using a, a purchase order uh, mechanism uh, that you can track that, uh, that is often not into the system that you can pull out, whether it's through a report or just a standard report out of the system. Um, so that's something that you may have to ask your contract folks to go back to those agreements, sub-agreements, and maybe do the little digging that you may have to do on that. So something to keep in mind there, too. Schedule K, uh, computing uh, any material overhead things in that nature, make sure that you also list that in there. Uh, and that's some of the changes and modifications that have been um, in, in put into place uh, as of June 2012. Going in a little bit into now the, the schedules themselves. Uh, Schedule A, uh, for those that, that uh, do this, I've done it in the past. Uh, it's a summary of all the, the claim rates, of course, the pools and the basis. Uh, one, um, one, one tip here that we have is to, to add a column there that actually um, that you can pull um, information that is out of your accounting system. Um, for example, the statement of indirect expenses, uh, for those that use those reports. Uh, they can actually add, plug those values in there um, uh, to ensure that the, the, the submission itself is validating against what's in your system. Um, it's something as simple as that. I get it because you can get a report in front of you on your desk and kind of compare that. But um, I tell you, it does help a lot to ensure that you're aligning and you think you're taking down everything there. Now, on Schedule B for the G&A um, expenses, uh, now, in, in this type of schedules, as we go through the next schedules related to the pools, um, make sure that you are uh, uh, reporting um, based on your, uh, how you're set up. For example, if you have multiple departments, uh, you want to in the different organizations, um, uh, especially for those that uh, use uh, uh, independent or individual call centers. So make sure that you have those listed in columns, and of course, um, totaling that at the end. Uh, one of the other um, considerations here is the service center allocations. Um, a lot of times, what we find is that so you take um, the service centers, um, but you people are actually just put in the values directly onto the schedule. Uh, that shouldn't be the case. What you should be considering and doing, to be honest, is to actually have the link directly from the service centers. Um, because as the audits um, occur and the, and, the, and the auditors are actually looking at this stuff, they're going to be able to trace that. They need to trace that stuff down. And they don't want hard code values. They actually want to trace that through the links. Um, and of course, as I mentioned in the previous slide, have a total column there. Have a validation column, as I would call it, uh, where you have the, the verification or, or the validation uh, column where you can have, or you can pull the data and have values there as well to compare it against your accounting system. Okay, um, going into Schedule C, uh, for, for these are the overheads. Uh, same concept, same, same idea, same recommendation. Have it across, uh, have it make sure based on your cost centers. Um, but one thing to, 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 to point out in this is the fact that if you have multiple overhead pools, uh, you can take, you can do it two ways. You can have it all in one schedule and make and make it a little more confusing, especially for the auditors. Uh, so instead, break that down into multiple worksheets, meaning multiple schedules, you know, um, and, and have a C-1, C-2, for example, as different schedules. Make sure that you're separating the, the, the pools in that fashion. And of course, don't forget about the tip to have that validation uh, column there. Schedule D, uh, this is related to the intermediate pools, of course. Um, again, make sure that you're breaking that down based on cost centers. Uh, and also uh, ensure that if you have multiple service centers, that you have multiple worksheets or, or schedules. Um, but the one thing I, I probably say and highlight in this slide is the fact that you have to examine and make sure that any unallocated service center values or dollars are, are if there are some, um, they, maybe you're looking at a report that you have in out of, out of the accounting system, and somehow there's still dollars that were not un, that were not allocated. So that's something you have to go back. In, 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 in inquire about whether you need to engage your, your GL people or your accounting folks or whoever is doing that, but something to keep in mind. And of course, don't forget about the new thing. 
Uh, French, um, same thing, again, um, uh, based on call centers. The one, um, also, it needs to be in its own schedule, uh, multiple worksheets, keep that in mind. But the one tip that we have here is the fact that, um, and, and, and it actually is creating um, inadequacy letters being issued, which actually come from that, because of the fact that um, the allocation of the French full dollars not being uh, shown onto the schedule. And, and, and what I mean by that is, for example, if overhead, if the overhead pool has an excellent amount of dollars that um, that French apply, if you will, then that means that uh, you, you got to spread that out. So what they want to see is the allocation itself across the various pools, final pools, and also intermediate pools. Um, one, this is an interesting one. This is this is one that um, is nowhere in the ICE model. Uh, it's nowhere in, in, in the requirements, but they actually ask for it, which is, you know, you, just, you, uh, you ask yourself that question, but okay. Um, unallowable worksheets. Those are not, this not, it's not a schedule, but we recommend that you do this. And the reason why we recommend that you do this is because um, you got to break it up between what's GNA and what's non-GNA, okay? Things, uh, in, in, the term, in terms of non-GNA, uh, any, any direct calls or any, any overhead, um, for example, both for DM and things of that nature, you break that down because of the fact that you have to, when you get into the rate calculations, the non-GNA analogs should go back into the GNA base. That's the standard practice. A lot of times, the accounting system will not do that, um, and it's not set up to do that. So that's something that you got to keep in mind as you're working on the interconsolation. Okay. okay. Um, diving into Schedule E now. Uh, as for those that have done this, it you know, brings all the pool um, dollars and all the base dollars and brings it all and calculates the rate. Uh, one recommendation on this schedule is to um, make sure that you have the right description um, to reflect, as it says here, um, how your allocation base is. For example, what is included in your French fee? What is included in your GNA fee? Whether well, it's a total cost input, uh, CCI, as some people may know it as, uh, or value added cost. Make sure that you have the right description there. Remember, don't forget about the non-GNA. Got to go right into the GNA base. And the one tip that we have in the schedule: have a tie Always have a tie where it takes all of the dollars that you have in Schedule E, takes the non-burden ODCs that perhaps are not part of your Schedule E because they're outside of the rate calculations, and compare that against Schedule H, which we will talk about in, in, in the next couple of slides. And, and compare the two together and have that variance to ensure that hey you have accounted for all of the costs as it compares Schedule E with Schedule H. Now, into Schedule H, uh, uh, it, it's, you, you're really reporting all of the different contracts, their costs, including commercial contracts. Of course, it's got to go into its own section and grouping. But one, uh, some additional information onto the schedule is the fact that um, it's not on the ICE model again. Um, customer agency, the final agency that needs to be referenced as a column, uh, classified. That's certainly something that also is, is needed. Um, in, 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 and again, they're not into the ICE model. Um, one column that uh, we often see that is missed as we are reviewing things for our customers is the fact that the subcontracts ID, meaning that the performance of a sub to a prime, uh, they've gotta, there's got to be some, some reference to that. Um, and you, sh you should have some, some ID number as it pertains to that. So make sure that you have that. And as you can see also in the screenshot below. I'll continue on, on Schedule H. Um, this is a big question. At what level are we going to report this on? Um, is that at the lowest level where the cost is being recorded? Uh, one of the things that we go through and we help a lot of our customers with is, 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 is recommending that you consider the billing level. The billing level is actually what the government gets anyway. So um, as the government is reviewing and, and DCA auditors are reviewing this, they're gonna, they're more, more than likely they're going to be they're going to have those those invoices and what is being reported uh, at the billing level. So that's the recommendation that we do for our customers, and that may be at different levels, of course. I mean, per contract. So that's something to also consider. Um, one of the other things is uh, make sure that you're segregating um, um, the contracts uh, into this, uh, their own individual buckets, meaning cost plus, CNN, fixed price, and, and commercial. Don't think that because you are a sub to a prime, that is considered a commercial contract. Make sure that if it is a prime that is a federal contract, 
is got to go into the right bucket, not a commercial section. Uh, and of course, don't forget about a uh, final tieout against your uh, PML. Uh, this is comparing what the total cost, direct cost, and applied rates are um, against what you have in your income statements. Um, that is a, 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 something that is often missed and not done. Uh, so that's something that we highly recommend that you do as part of your overall final tie -out. Uh, one other, uh, here's some, uh, a sample of a, of a Schedule H. Um, this is a system-generated um, uh, reporting tool, system-generated um, Schedule H. Uh, we'll get to um, some of, the, uh, some of the, uh, the things, how you can leverage some of the reporting tools. But here's one example of uh, what type of information you can leverage in a reporting tool to extract out of your system. I mean, imagine your Schedule H, right? It could be thousands of rows depending on what level your reporting is on. So uh, leveraging reporting tools could really come in handy in doing this. Now, Schedule H-1, this is where you know, the government participation across the various pools. Um, it's a simple schedule, but it is often also missed when you have changes to your structure, when you have changes to your pools. Uh, make sure that this is in sync with, um, with Schedule H, that it, it, they're all aligned properly. And also add a check into the schedule, as you see on the screenshot below, where it actually compares it against Schedule H to ensure all the dollars across all the, base, all the bases are accounted. Now, I believe we have another poll. I'm going to give it back to Brian, and um, we'll go through that. Thank you. Thanks, Carlos. Yeah, Carlos mentioned a couple of slides back about tying out to Schedule H to your P&L statement. So we want to know, are you currently validating Schedule H against your financial statements? Who's following this best practice and how that's going for you? So if you would take a moment on that poll. Looks like we're getting a good response rate. You know, Carlos talked extensively about validating against the various statements to your financial statements to the schedules. Give you a few more seconds. Close the poll. Well, excellent. Looks like many of you are already validating your Schedule H against your financial statements. Carlos, how does that match up with your experience? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, it's close to 20%. I, I are probably not doing it to, to the extent that we're, we're recommending it. It's something that I'll, I'll certainly uh, uh, continue to push and, and highlight in terms of doing that validation for those that are not doing it. Sounds like we got a good crowd out there today, and they're doing the right work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, continuing on. Um, schedule I, uh, uh, this is another very important schedule, right? This is what you tell the government and you submit this, right, when you're having the under and over billings. Um, make sure that um, you are aligning the contracts with Schedule H. We talked about Schedule H about the different levels, uh, what level you're doing it on, whether it's at the billing level, lowest level, but you know what, you've got to be aligned properly. Otherwise, they're going to send you an inadequacy letter saying they're not, they're not aligned. So. Um, make sure that you're doing that. Um, make sure you, 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 you list out all the information, such as uh, um, uh, the prime ID and, and sub ID, stuff like that. The one thing I highlight on this, which is often missed, is the fact that there are two little columns into that schedule. And there, that's the penalty clause, and that's the physically complete uh, 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 column in there. Those are typically and often missed, because there's such a small column that that do I need to do that or not? So make sure that you are actually flagging them. And there really is a yes or no, why or and, really, to, 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 to consider that. Um, one thing here um, that I want to highlight as well is the new, uh, the new tip here is to develop a process for analyzing the over and under billing variance. If you have a million dollar variance, I'm praying that you don't, um, but if you do, um, you know, there's got to be a reason for that. And, and to do that, you've got to make sure that you are tracing those variances that makes sense to you before you submit your income cost um, Schedule eight, um, I'm sorry, um, J, this is for the subcontractor information. Make sure that um, you have, of course, the sub ID, the prime number, point of contact, all, all that stuff. Uh, the one thing um, that we, we highly recommend is that you have a tie out on the bottom, as you can see, where it takes what you have in J, and it actually compares it what you have in Schedule H, because they should tie out. 
um, a lot of times auditors, um, if you don't have this, they somehow have a hard time tracing that back. So um, why not uh, give that to them so they can just see it right in front of them that there's a formula there for the Schedule H total of 26 to 10, 26 million that is, and they know how to find it. Um, it trust me, it, it comes a long way if you do that. Yeah. Schedule K, uh, summary of hours. I mean, this is stuff, you know, this is reporting all of your TNM contracts. Of course, make sure that the hours are correct, that's for sure. But the one thing I want to highlight in this schedule is the fact that um, the GNA, uh, in the case of GNA, if you, if, if you are um, putting the GNA rate or forcing the GNA rate to match up to your billings, well, that's not correct. You need to let the model and have the GNA calculator rate within the in-car cost emission that you're working on actually do the calculations for the GNA being applied. Now, there's a, there's a column back in Schedule I um, that is a contract limitation schedule. So if there are ceilings or some type of thresholds on a specific contract, that's how you use that. Don't force the GNA rate in the schedule because that is not something that it will be correct. Uh, moving into Schedule L, uh, reconciliation of total payroll. Uh, of course, that's your labor distribution, right, as, 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 as incurred. Uh, against your your um, your 941s, your IRS uh, forms, um, make sure that uh, you will have the direct links, of course, with the, from the other schedules, and of course all of the accrual uh, variances and, and, and adjustments. I, I would say rather uh, in terms of vacation and things like that, and the pre-tax wages, flexible, you know, um, uh, labor related and things like that. Um, you want to make sure that you adjust in all of that um, um, in the schedule. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, plus minus one percent variance. It is generally acceptable. Um, if you have a 5 to 10 percent variance, I highly suggest that you go back and find that variance. Uh, you should be really, you should be doing this already as part of your payroll process, anyway. Um, but uh, make sure. I mean, it, it, it's a high variance. You, you got to go back and look at that. Um, M schedule M. That that narrative type of schedule. Um, uh, you really are reporting uh, in a narrative manner um, any 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 decisions, any changes in your organization, any memos issued by the contracting officer. Uh, so make sure that you you listen those things that are that are impacting your um, your indirect rates, even you know especially right. If they're impacting that, uh, you got you got to make sure that uh, you know. One example I would say is uh, you add in new pools, right? Maybe you add in a material handling pool. That's something that would go into the schedule. You got to reference that into the schedule. Okay. Um, schedule N, uh, it's a form. You just gotta sign it by the, usually by a C-level executive, usually a CFO. Um, make sure you use the right date, please. Uh, it's often missed uh, where you're taking the last year's submission and moving it over to the new year, and that date is correct. It's incorrect because you're using the last year's date. Uh, make sure you do that. Make sure you catch that before you submit it. Okay, um, moving into Schedule L, um, this is contract closing information. Uh, those are the contracts that uh, have been completed within the fiscal year in, in question, the ones you're working on. Uh, of course, think about the flexibly priced contract that they will have to go on to this. Um, one of the things that um, um, uh, I mentioned already in Schedule I is that if you're flagging it as physically completed um, in Schedule I, they got to be in Schedule O. Uh, if they're not, um, you'll be... Um, uh, certain that they will be coming back and asking why those things are not aligned properly. So keep that in mind, please. Now, um, as, now we got some supplemental schedules. Uh, this is a comparative analysis. This is A1 through 4. Uh, really is across the pools and across uh, also includes the red cost. Uh, make sure that uh, the one highlight here, the one note that I will make on this one, is the fact that it, if, if, if they are, um, as you compare it to last year, to the previous year, uh, make sure you have explanations and come up with the, with, the, with the threshold process where you say, okay, anything over 20%, for example, um, uh, in terms of a percent change, uh, you have to provide some explanations on because they will ask for that. So if you let them know what your process is and you are providing those explanations, that is, you're good to go. I mean, you're certainly a lot better than not doing that because they probably will ask and more than likely they will do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, supplemental B. Uh, executive comp, well, it's called supplemental, but it's not optional. Uh, you got to do it. I mean, it's, it's 10 out of 10, that's what they're asking for. 
uh, uh, at the point of entry, at the point that they're receiving the income confirmation. So if you're not doing that, um, more than likely, uh, you know, they, uh, again, I mean, 10 out of 10, usually that's what they ask for, three most uh, uh, fiscal years, recent, um, and of, of course, don't forget about the top uh, five um, executives, uh, uh, compensated executives within the company. The one thing to highlight in the schedule is the, the, the threshold, the, the executive compensation threshold that is usually um, um, issued by the White House, and that's from their website. So, and, and, and they, haven't, they haven't changed until recently in December, I believe, there was a report out that they actually changed that. Uh, make sure that you're looking into that, especially if you're going over the threshold and compensation. And also think about the benchmarks and comparability factors. Um, that is something that DCAA, based on the report about the 74%, um, remember the, 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 the IG uh, report said um, uh, that I haven't, haven't been done properly. So that, that's going to be quite a bit of focus also on executive compensation going forward. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, other supplemental schedules, not to spend too much time on these, but supplemental C, I mean, not often required, but certainly something you should have. But the one to have is the contract reuse. That's something you should be doing regardless of the income cost submission. That is something that is not optional, something that you've got to keep up with the modifications, and can also be system generated. I mean, if, if you have the information into your accounting system or into your project you know, uh, management system, uh, make sure that you can also leverage that and, and have a, a, a report that can be generated as well. Okay. Um, some other, um, uh, no, we now diving into some reports um, options here. Uh, we talked about how um, it makes a lot of information that, that goes into these income cost submissions. Um, a, a lot of times there are thousands of rows, rows that have to go into some of the schedules. One not leverage in this case, we, 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 we in the case of Cognos Impromptu, for those uh, customers or those folks that organizations that use this system, um, you can get information out. You can actually create um, formatted reports that can address some of the schedules. Um, and also, in addition to that, you can also create or develop some reports that can also help you in your validation. For example, have an AR history report to be able to look at what's been built. Right? Um, there's all this, I mean, there's additional things you have to do. But it does help you. Now, another example is Schedule O. For, for uh, Schedule O itself, um, um, this is the contract closed within the, uh, that has been physically completed within the within the fiscal year. <clears throat> that is something that maybe um, you can write a report um, that uh, has uh, any contracts at any level, task level that is, claim level, however, however you, you you want to report it at, and have that. Um, uh, include or filter that based on the period of performance. So if it ends within the fiscal year of 2013, then why not have a report that gives you the, at least a starting point of all of those, um, all of those um, contracts that, that you need to have into this report. And then from there, do the, the right analysis and, and, and dig in the, the digging that you'll, you'll need to do in that. Now, um, for those that are using Delta CER, I know a lot of folks probably on this call and this webinar uh, are using uh, uh, cost point and, and have um, Delta CER or Cognos 8 or 10 for that matter. Um, one of the things uh, to consider here is that all, all major schedules are addressed. Um, but there are things that you have to do um, that, uh, for example, in the Inca cost submission, there are codes set up, in, it is a code, code set up in cost point that you have to uh, make sure you flag it, right? So there's some tweaking and some changes that you have to do um, uh, in cost point in order for this can reports that come out of the package to work. Uh, one thing to point out on Schedule J, that's for the subcontractor information, is the fact that if you're not using a purchasing module, for the example in cost point, those reports would not um, necessarily work. There are other avenues on how to develop a report that can get you that information. But some information may may likely not be there. But again, I mean, those are the type of things to consider when you're looking at uh, the CAN reports that Delta provides uh, out of the package and uh, some changes that we'd have to do. Um, regardless whether you use an impromptu, whether you use Incognos, um, um, A10, CER, Crystal reports, um, business objects, it doesn't matter. Uh, the need to validate 
and, and checks and balances. I mean, you got to do that. You can't just trust the data that those reports actually get you. Get you. Um, and, and, you know, of course, and, and, and some of the reports also may need modifications as well. Um, so we talked about inadequacy letters briefly in the presentation by Brian when he started. Um, the other things to, to consider and to really keep an eye out, uh, an eye out for, for, meaning for Schedule A, for example, um, make sure you have all the pools. Uh, just because you just have them, uh, you have to have the final pools and also the intermediate pools. A lot of times the intermediate pools are, are missed or not included. You've got to have all of them listed. Uh, in the French um, schedule, uh, have the allocations. I've, I've mentioned this early on in the slides where you have to have um, the French schedule uh, um, in the allocations referenced and listed on, on the schedule itself. Make sure you have that. Um, for Schedule E, make sure that don't forget about the unallowables. Don't forget, don't forget about the unallowable worksheet that I mentioned to you already. And also make sure that the non-GNA amounts are actually added back to, to, to the GNA data. For Schedule H, uh, make sure that you're not missing those um, columns, those extra fields that are not in the ICE model, keep that in mind, make sure you remember that, but are needed because that's what they're asking for. Uh, so ensure that you have those extra columns there. Um, continuing on, uh, some other schedules here, for example, H1, I talked about make sure that, is, that you are accounting for all of the pools and make sure that you have the checks and balance in there too. Uh, the, uh, schedule I, I already talked about it, the penalty provisions and physically complete flag. Uh, don't miss that. It's something as simple as that, although it may require you, require you to go back um, and look at the contracts themselves, um, but those should be referenced. Don't forget about those. Uh, Schedule J, um, uh, the period of performance, um, and also value of those subcontracts that you have need to be listed into, the, into that schedule. And Schedule L, I thought about a plus minus 1%. Um, if it's more than that, please go back and reconcile that. Again, you should already be doing that as part of your overall year-end process or even quarterly process for that matter. But make sure that you're doing that. Okay. Now, we have another poll. We're going to give it back to Brian. I think this thanks, will be Carlos. my time. He'll close it up. And thanks, everybody, for joining today. Thank you, Carlos. And you know, when we started the program, we asked how many people are submitting incurred cost proposal. And one of the questions we often get from government contractors is, well, how likely am I to get an inadequacy letter? We have with us today, you, the, you, our listeners, a very large sample of government contractors. So we're going to be able to answer the question of how likely you are to, to receive it just by this simple little poll. So have you recently received an inadequacy letter? This will give us a good sense of what the probability is of you getting, getting such a letter after you submit your proposal. Give you a few more seconds. We've got a couple more results coming in. Appreciate everybody's time today. And there we have it. If I can round off a little, it looks like about 30% have received an inadequacy letter, 70% uh, have not. Uh, Carlos, what are your thoughts on, on those results? You know, um, it, it doesn't surprise me, Brian. Um, we do get quite a bit of customers that are, are, are in need of support in terms of in, interpreting and making sense of what those uh, letters say. Um, and a lot of times are very simple things to, that, that really need to be fixed, and, and that's why we, we're sitting here um, uh, showing you guys, you know, what are the things that you can do to really avoid, and some of them are really simple. Yeah. And I was just wondering, you know, and are all of those inadequacy letters, I hate to put a point on it, but are they with merit or? You know what? Um, sometimes they are, they are. I mean, some of them do have quite a bit of merit, but some of them, no. And, and that's another point to make, Brian. That's a good point. It's the fact that don't be afraid to push back because that's exactly what we do a lot of times because a lot of times, you know, they're not looking in the right places. And sometimes you have to tell them where to look to. Um, and it's as simple as just say, hey, by the way, look into the schedule. Uh, row, you know, 40, still, you know, E40, you know, that's, that's what you need to look for. Uh, and, and a lot of times that happens. So um, that's certainly something that uh, you got to review those inadequacy letters. you got to go back to your submissions and ensure that they all make sense. And if you can push back, push back, please do. Thanks, Carlos. And I want to highlight for people some other resources if you have questions. 
while we're getting ready to answer your questions directly. Upcoming, we do have a webinar, direct and indirect cost webinar. Very, it relates very much to in preparing your incurred cost proposals. We also have training courses available to you. And we have our blog posts where we blog on various topics, including incurred cost submissions and proposals. Of course, feel free to check out DCAA and the OMB, excellent resources for you to look, look at. Let's go to the questions now, and so that we can answer the questions that are uppermost on your mind. Of course, one of the questions we always get, and I see it here, is the, um, will this presentation be available to us? Yes, we've recorded today's presentation, and we will make it available to you in a few days. What is the definition of, of an executive? And um, you know, that was, what was that, Supplemental B? So what is the definition of an executive? Sure, sure, Brian. Um, one of the things here is, is, is really anyone within the organization uh, who's a senior decision maker, uh, typically a C-level um, 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 position. Um, and don't forget, I mean, I mentioned this in the, in the previous slide, uh, the five most highly compensated employee in a management position has to be listed into that. Uh, make sure that you have the trend um, of, of the three running years, previous years also that are listed. So, um, but it really does come down to the executive right? Okay. And what is the definition of physically closed contract? I recall that was Schedule I, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, you know, that's um, you know, that's really any contract for which the the work uh, uh, is fully completed, right? And in a period of performance falls within the fiscal year. So um, that may not be it may not be a fully closed out. Um, um, but it's certainly something that um, the period of performance does end. Uh, that, that's something that um, you know you have to you have to consider that. Okay. If you have multiple fringe pools, do you just add additional schedules to document to document this? And is there a best practice? Yep. Yep. Um, I, I mentioned this earlier in terms of if you have multiple pools across, whether it's fringe, overhead, and GNA. Make sure that you have multiple worksheets, meaning more multiple tabs, in the, in the spreadsheet. So um, ensure that um, that you have them listed. Don't combine it all together because that confuses the auditor. That even confuses maybe someone that's looking at it a year later. Um, make sure that you have um, multiple worksheets or multiple tabs in the, in the in the in the Excel file. Okay. Okay. What if your rate structure does not fit into the ICE model. Um, this person, she's tried making the DCA model, but it's, <laughs> as he says, so much trouble, or she says so much trouble, my apologies. She's been adding new schedules, so it looks like their model, and trying to include the model, changes and updates. Is this okay, or will I get into trouble at some point? Oh, boy. Um, ICE model is always uh, giving people headaches. Um, it, it, it's such a... Um, uh, the ma I mentioned this in the beginning in terms of macros, um, and, and it doesn't give a lot of the flexibility. I mean, it does allow you to kind of set up the page and set up the ice model and all of that. My recommendation is always to have your own model, right? I mean, certainly, you know, have a starting point with, um, uh, with the ice model itself, but have your own file, right? Because it's your, it's your organization, it's your company, that um, that is going to make changes and things like that. So ensure that you you're comfortable with what you're doing. And so typically, what we do for a lot of our customers is that we have our own template that we use. We don't use the ICE model, but we do take into account all of the um, all of the changes that are uh, make sure make, making sure that we're staying up to date with them. Hey, Carlos, someone's saying that DCA is trying to tell them that they need to provide the top ten compensated employees, regardless of management duties. Uh, why do they do this? Uh, because um, uh, okay, they don't know. <laughs> oh, no, I think it, it really comes down to um, uh, making sure that um, that is a rule, and I'd be more than happy to, um, um, to 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 point you in the right direction when it comes down to those rules. Uh, they actually, um, I believe, they are listed even in the manual, the DCA and Cost Commission manual for that as well. So that's certainly something that uh, should not be the case. Um, and it doesn't surprise me, to be honest with you. A lot of times, um, you know, a lot of these auditors um, that, are, that are coming on board um, are, are, are 
for lack of a better term, they are, they are not as experienced as some of the others. Um, so it depends who you have as the auditor. So a lot of times you have to almost um, you know, explain to them and, and, and tell them what, what to look for. Yep. Here's one, Carlos. I'm completing the ICE model for the first time and find it very confusing. I'd like to get it reviewed upon completion before submitting it. Any suggestions on where to get help with this? Um, I love questions like this. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, well, you know, a, a, a lot of times um, folks think, well, we, we're doing all of the incur cost uh, support, meaning from start to finish. But a lot of times, what, what we also do is review those submissions that um, that are some of those folks, some of those uh, companies uh, need. So uh, we'd be more than happy to help you with that uh, in terms of just um, having another set of eyes uh, into into your anchor cost submission and point out things that perhaps you could be doing and changing and make sure that you stay compliant. How should you handle it if you have, I should have done the ICE, my inco incurred cost proposal before, I should have done it in the past, but I did not. What do I do now? <laughs> well, um, you have two options. One is don't do it, <laughs> right? And, and, and wait until they knock on your door and, 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 um, and and, and, and go back and, 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 you know, when they ask for it and do it, right? I, I wouldn't recommend that option. I, I think you've got to be proactive. I think you need to um, go back to, to those years that need to be done and, and, and take the opportunity to do those. Um, you know, you don't have to do them, you know, within a week, but, I mean, take your time, right, in terms of doing them, but do have them available in case they do ask for it. Okay. And this is a question involved, uh, regarding CER. Yeah. And yeah, does every have company have access to the ICE schedules in the CER? You know, is it in the standard package? Mm -hmm. um, I, my understanding, and again, I'm not Delta, so I've got to put it out there, um, is that, that 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 does come with the standard package um, if you do have CER. Um, now, it depends also on the version of CER that you're in as well. If you go back um, some uh, um, earlier versions of um, what it used to be called um, Delta Performance Management, DPM. Um, um, so it really depends on which version you're on. But uh, my understanding, uh, putting that caveat out there, is the fact that it does come with the standard package. Very good. And uh, what are they seeking when they ask ask for release to prime and submission received? What are they seeking, if you could repeat the question again? Yeah. What are they seeking when they ask for release to prime and submission receive yes, no on supplemental schedule C? Oh, um, I think that's probably related to one of the old schedules. Um, I'm not sure which schedule is referenced there on that question. Uh, there, there was one question, there, there used to be one, one schedule uh, towards the end, whether it's W uh, or X, um, where you can sign off in, um, in, 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 in agreeing to release your submission to other, other folks other than DCAA or DCMA for that matter. Um, so that's, that's how um, that question that the schedule is for. Um, and, and so that's something that typically is a no, right? You don't want anybody to look at your financials or your incur costs. So that's something, something that you, you wouldn't be doing, uh, at least that would be my recommendation. Okay. Does a home office with no government contracts need to file? Does a home office with no government contracts need to file? Um, I go back to the question about the contract itself. Mm -hmm. It's all about the contract itself. Um, go back to the contract, look at those clauses in there, uh, especially if it's a you know, uh, 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 cost plus contract, T&M contract, uh, flexibly priced contract reference. Uh, you got to go back mm -hmm. to that. Regardless of home office or not office, it doesn't matter. I mean, we have plenty of clients that they have a virtual office because a lot of the folks are working into um, uh, other government sites, and you still have to submit one. So okay. that, I mean, the, the, the home office, facilities, things like that, it, it should have no bearing into, into the question about submitting one or not. Okay. Uh, if we're resubmitting a prior year, can we use the new model? Should we use the new model? Um, what I'm finding is the fact that if you are resubmitting or making changes to a prior year submission, is that DCAA is going to hold you accountable with the changes in terms of the new changes that have come into play recently. So what I would suggest, whether it's a new model or whether it's an adjusted model that you have, ensure that you have those changes implemented into whatever you submitted or resubmitted. Mm. 
you know, you mentioned about subs, and, and they should not be considered commercial, but if it's a second-tier sub, are you then considered, a, is it a commercial contract at that point? No. I mean, the prime contract is still a government contract, if in fact it is. If it is, then it shouldn't be. A, and this is, this is one notion that I see quite a bit when people are, um, um, are, are flagging them and grouping them into the commercial, um, uh, into the commercial section of Schedule H. Um, and a lot of times they do that, and DCA comes back and says, well, oh, no, I don't think so. The, this contract actually is flagged, uh, or they have it in their records as a, as, a, as a true government contract, so you have to go back and, and move it up. Any okay. other questions? Yeah, um, there was a reference to, you know, you mentioned IDIQ, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity yes. contract. Yes. What if you haven't gotten any task orders on that contract yet? Then there's no incurred cost. Okay. So, um, so there's no incurred cost at all, um, and um, so from from my perspective, is you wait for those task orders to be issued, and then from there you look at the uh, 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 the language in those task orders, and then from there you you make a decision whether you're required or not. Okay. So? We had a request to show the slide listing who should submit the ICE again. Um, yeah, sure, we can do that. We can go back to the previous slides. I can't remember what number it was, but we can go back. That'd be all the way back. Keep a reference of the FAR the four clause, right? That that's certainly something that uh, if those contracts are governed by that and they are referenced um, in, into the into the actual contract documentation, uh, that's something that you, you have to um, uh, be uh, aware of. Um, you know, remember, the co uh, flexibly priced contract, so uh, cost type and t and contracts. Um, it can also flow down into LOE type contracts. Um, so uh, those are the things that uh, that you have to keep an eye out for. Uh, but it, here's a slide that for, for the question pertaining to this. Okay, great. Thanks, Carlos. If you have more questions, you know, please feel free to email Carlos or me. Uh, you know, anytime you have a question, even if it's just a quick question, you know, please feel to reach out to Carlos and see if he can give you a hand. Yeah, and I'd be happy to answer. I mean, a lot of times it's just a matter of simple questions, and uh, and it would be more than happy to to answer that. I can certainly um, um, have um, you know any of my folks um, help out with that as well. Okay? okay. I hope you all found this helpful today. Hopefully, we helped you to mitigate your risk of receiving an inadequacy letter. Given that DCA have done 1,600 audits per year, hopefully we've helped reduce some risk there. Thank you, everyone. Look forward to seeing you again.